Uh, thanks again for that. Uh, our second talk is going to be, here's the description here, here it is. Uh, so it's going to be called Functional Programming and Django Query Sets. So John Mitchell, with the Twitter handle of John Tells All, which is pretty cool, um, is an expert Python and DevOps teacher with 20 years experience. He shows up to a lot of LA Django events, and we'd love to have him. So let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> here is the shirt clip thing. Okay, so it seems like most people have beer or uh, other very important things. Um, thank you, thank you all for, for having me. Uh, this talk is Functional Programming and Django Query Sets. I've actually given this talk a couple different times. The, the URL for the slides <laughs> is tiny.cc slash JTA for John Tells All and QS4 for quality, no, for Query Sets 4. Um, this is fun because I always have different audiences. I always expand it for different people. The last time I did this one is for just uh, generic Python people, so it's mostly focused on iterators and functional programming. This time it'll cover that, but then it'll be more. Um, Marcel asked me to expand it a little bit in certain directions. And thanks for Brian for uh, giving us a talk about uh, doing pre canned responses. <clears throat> right. Um, Marcel already gave me a Good introduction. Uh, my Twitter handle, etc., is John Tells All. I work for the Black Tux in uh, Santa Monica. We do online tuxedo rentals, and yes, of course, we're hiring. <clears throat> so today I'm going to cover basically three ideas. One is an iterator or generator is basically like a stream. It's very efficient. You can process millions of items with it without a problem, um, and it's sexy, so that's kind of nice. Functional programming is super awesome because everybody thinks it's super hard and super difficult and they all kind of freak out and it's actually not a big deal. Um, it has a number of nice properties in terms of it makes it easier to test. And a query set is a stream and there's going to be some intersections between these two things. So how many people are comfortable with iterators and generators in Python? Just good old fashioned Python. Okay, a good number. Okay. Uh, how many people use functional programming? Oh, a good number too. Good. You guys maybe can tell me where I'm missing stuff. Because everybody has different definitions, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. This is basically the three bits. And this is a warning, there will be code, there will be lots of code. This is a technical talk. And the little kid is never wrong. All right, so iterators. Um, this is basically a review. Um, an iterator is a stream of data, sort of like a restricted compact list. Everybody uses this. Like if you do a database cursor, that's basically an iterator. Uh, so if you do the list, one, two, you get a list, and it, and it has the memory for the entire list all at once. And so it knows everything about that list. On an iterator, you get this weird object, list iterator object at this magic hex address. An iterator is basically like a cursor. You have a single bit of data, you can get the next bit, and that's it. There's nothing else. But it's very efficient. So you get a bunch of uh, benefits. You guys already use iterators for everything. Like if you open this very important old-fashioned recipe, then uh, you can just do four line in F, where F is your open file handle, print the line, and there you go. Notice you're not going back and forth in the file. You're not figuring out if you're at the end. You're not figuring out at the beginning. You're not doing every other. You're just grabbing the lines as they come, and then that's it. How many people like uh, old fashions? Uh, you will. <laughs> List of iterators are very similar. Like in the first case for line and open ing.txt, you're doing an iterator, but it, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. So it could be a list. The second one, you're actually doing a concrete iterator, which looks kind of strange. You never actually do it this way, but you get the idea. Um, lastly, or thirdly, for non and 2468, you have a concrete list on the right-hand side, and you're just kind of going through them. And lastly, um, who uses Glob? All right, people. Um, all right, so Glob is a super useful thing. You do Glob start at text, and you get a list of all your text files. There you go. It's uh, Glob is super useful. Um, iGlob is the same thing except an iterator. So if you have a confused company that stores a million images in a directory, and if you do ls and says star not found or something like that because the shell prompt is freaking out, something like iGlob which is an iterator version of Glob, will still get you every single text file, but it will go through them one at a time. 
which means if you have a million, it might take a while, but it won't crash, which is nice. So why would you use iterators over lists? Who knows how to, why this is? You in the back? Yeah, memory. Memory. Uh, okay. Um, another answer? Yeah, pretty much just. Memory? You don't have to compute the list in memory. You don't have to compute the, the copy the whole content of the list. You don't have to copy the whole content of the list to be able to process it if you're using an iterator. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that what you said? Okay. Marcel? I'd say that you can start returning the results sooner because you can start returning the first item as soon as it encounters the first item and then worry about the second item when that's requested instead of waiting until you get the entire list back before you return the whole thing as a whole. That's a good point. What Marcel said is uh, if you have a list and you're calculating things on the end, if you wanted to start re start processing the beginning, you'd have to wait until the end. everything is being calculated. But, and if you have an infinite list, that might take a while. Um, so, But if you have an iterator, you can start processing results at the same time as the, the next values are being um, next values are being calculated, and that's a good way to do it. It's lazy. Uh, it's lazy. Yes. Um, so um, our friends at Python say that tools that use iterators are more em memory efficient and often faster than their list-based counterparts. To be honest, I haven't done any timing things. I do I do functional programming and iterators and generators because I think they look nice and they make it they're, they're very expressive, uh, but they're also faster. So what can you do with an iterator? We've kind of covered this. Um, basically, you get an iterator and you do f dot next, um, and you get a result. Then you do f dot next again, and then you get the next thing. So in this case, we're going through a very important uh, old-fashioned recipe. But what happens in the end? What happens if you do uh, F equals open for dev null, where there's nothing there. And then you have an iterator where you do f dot next. what do you get? You get nothing. Python represents nothing by doing a, a stop exception, a stop iteration. And this is nice because you can actually program your own iterators, but that'll be in it for another talk. So what happens if you, in the second case, you can just do create an iterator, give it an empty list, do dot next on it, and you get the exact same behavior. The second case is really nice for testing. You just create an empty list, get the next version of it, and it, and it throws an exception for you, which is nice. What can you not do with an iterator? You can't do any slicing. There's no first, there's no last, there's no third, there's no nothing. If you open our very important recipe, and then you do F bracket zero, it'll immediately crash with a type error saying, the file iterator, you doesn't have the, it doesn't obey the slice protocol in terms of you can't do F dot zero. This is actually a bummer. I wish that Python would actually let you do, hey, give me the first item of a list. Um, we'll see that Django actually does let you do this. What else can you not do with an iterator? Um, since an iterator is basically a single item and then you can get the next one, you, there's no length. How can you tell how long this, this file is? If you do the length of the, uh, the file handle itself, it says object of type file has no length. This, okay, you know, you never actually do this in real programs, so that's not a big deal, but if, you do, if, you want, if you're processing a million items and you want to see how far along you were, it'd be nice to tell how long the iterator was, but you can't do it, so it's tough. So this is basically the summary of lists versus iterators. On the, overall, uh, our, our friend in the audience said that iterators are lazy in terms of they don't actually do anything until you ask it. So it's nice because if, if you're calculating an infinite list, you know, an eager list is going to be slow. I mean, if, well, it's going to take a while, whereas an iterator will give you the first element and the second element the third element, that kind of thing. For memory, the list has to keep every single element in memory all the time, which gives you nice, nice properties, but it also takes a lot of memory. Whereas an iterator takes basically no memory. Length, you could do it on a list, you can't do it on an iterator. Um, slice is not supported in iterators, so you have to use this funky notation called iSlice. If you do a list, if you do x bracket 3, you want the first three elements. If you do iSlice of x, where x is the iterator, you get the first three elements. But this is, looks really darky, um, and deal with it. Um, in addition, in, if you're dealing with a list, you do x plus y, you get the concepts of x plus the concepts of y. 
again, in Python, it doesn't really support it very well. It gives you this darky chain operator. And, and that, that works okay. Um, again, it, on a list, if you want to say, hey, is x within this list, you can specify just doing x and y. And in iterators, you can't. It just doesn't support it. Um, and as a consequence of all these things, lists are much easier to think about. If you don't care, just use lists for everything. It's, it's cool. Um, if you, and if you're doing web programming, where the longest thing you're ever going to process is 100 items, then maybe you can just deal with what lists your entire career. That's okay. Um, I think that's kind of darky, so I go with iterators pretty much for everything, because I might have a, a billion item list, right? So, so uh, one sec. Then. So, if you don't care, it's much easier to bug lists. So go ahead and do lists first, or take an iterator and then convert it to a list. Question for myself. Uh, I, I don't know if I missed this, but, down, but uh, both I slice and chain are both inside of the iter tools. That's correct. I slice and chain are both within the iter tools. Um, if you guys, and the major reason for doing functional programming is because it's it's super sexy, so you you always going to use the func tools and iter tools modules, and I'm going to talk about some other ones also. Um, the Penny Esther isn't here because she did a talk on Python three a while back. A big difference between Python two and Python three is in Python three almost a lot of the stuff just kind of goes away because Python three almost everything is iterators. Um, and we'll just leave it at that. So Python 2 is kind of kind of funky in this, in this respect. So common enumerator functions. Who uses enumerate? Okay, a good number. Enumerate is the, pretty much the simplest um, iterator function that's commonly used, with the exception of sorted. Sorted is also used a ton. Range is used a ton. This is another Python 2 versus Python 3 thing. Uh, dict.iteritems, who uses that one? Okay, good number, okay. Yeah, that's the most efficient way to get every single item in a list. And very important because it's used in functional programming but not a whole lot of normal programming is filter and map. Um, and I mentioned the iter tools module and also file input is super awesome which we'll talk about at another time. So there's my snowman, so that means it's the end of the iterator section. Uh, I guess we'll talk about functional programming next. Right, so questions about iterators and so forth. Does everybody have beer? <laughs> Cheers. Right, functional uh, question, yes. X plus Y and chain X, Y were those two open to do iterators? The question is, uh, in the statement x plus y, what is x and y? x and y are lists. Which means that on the right, x and y are iterators. Uh, to be honest, I just typed it and I was like, okay, trust me. Right, so iterators are cool and stuff. Functional programming. This is awesome because if you talk to people about functional programming, they look like this. They're like, what? What the hell is going on? The functional programming must be so cool. You are so smart, blah, blah, blah. No, functional programming is super easy. It's just a different way of doing things. And it has a number of nice properties. It's easy to, easier to test, which is my favorite thing. Uh, sometimes it's more efficient. Um, it kind of looks cool. You're able to make all these different functions, kind of plug them together, um, which is very flexible. <coughs> The practical advantages are modularity, composability, ease of debugging and testing, parallelization. You can actually say, okay, this infinite list affects this infinite list. They can live on different processors and so forth. And buzzwordy. Uh, all of you guys put functional programming on your resume. <laughs> if you're more serious about it, uh, which obviously I am not, there's other reasons for functional programming. Functions are first-class objects. If you're coming from other languages, it's kind of awkward to have like like everything as a class and that kind of stuff. It's it's kind of awkward to have flexible software in functional programming languages, including to some extent Python. You just kind of pass functions back and forth. Um, in all the examples I'm going to give, you're basically processing a whole list of elements. Uh, there's no side effects. This is a big one because if you read any bad programming books from the 90s, they talk about they talk about you know uh, modifying things in place and, and basic language and so forth. It's terrible. 
don't do that. In functional programming, you don't have side effects, uh, which is a, a, a number of nice properties. Likewise, you do expressions over statements. So if you do x equals 5 or something like that, that's like a statement. Or if you just do 5, that's an expression that says one of them expresses a value, the other one says, talks about state. State is evil. Uh, higher order functions. These are actually really cool. So you have functions that operate on functions, which operate on functions. If you go into the iter tools or some of the other third party modules, there's lots of really cool ones. So this is a super easy example. So we have is odd, number is odd if it's divisible. Uh, if it's if the, if the remainder from two is is one, so you filter is odd where you give it a function and you give it a list and it says okay the odd members are one and three. So this is super easy, but basically it shows you you make a you make a little stub function, and then you use one of these standard patterns and you pass the function into it and then you have a list of data. So if this data is infinite, it doesn't care. Um, so filter, actually I'll show you the details in a minute. Who uses filter and map? Okay, a good number, good. And the programming paradigms. Um, procedural is list of instructions, and you do a lot of x equals y plus 5, that kind of stuff. Object oriented is nice because you have um, a single assembly of state, and then also methods which operate on that state, and you can do specializations. I used to be a big object-oriented person, but now I think I'm kind of flipping back and forth. Okay, functional programming versus procedural. This is a good old-fashioned, I'll put my uh, old-fashioned recipe, where I have a, a block, and a block, and then a block that does some stuff. Well, you know, this is cool and so forth, but, you know, how do you test this? Everything's kind of embedded. It requires that you open this uh, output path as a file, or it requires that you open the input path, path as a file. If this is a more functional style, you basically have some values, maybe a file handle, you pass it into the function, and then it would do its thing. This is kind of a contrived example, but you get the idea. A lot of code in here just kind of says, oh, I'm always going to be in a file, therefore I'm going to do everything myself, I know everything. And this, is, this code is horrible because it's a pain to test. Therefore, it's broken. Uh, functional programming versus object orientation. Uh, an object always has state, which is evil, and specific functions to query and modify the state. Uh, classes are really cool because you can specialize them. So in this case, I'm a rewrite file. Um, I can make, and make specializations of this. So the rewrite file has a transform. So when you read one thing, and you, you do a custom transform, you write it out. If I want to uppercase a file, I just modify this one little transform thing, and the entire program does exactly what I want. If I want to list out the amounts of different quantities in my old-fashioned recipe and figure out how much of the precious uh, whiskey I'm going to get, then you know, I, that could be a very, another, a very important uh, subset of this program. So this is a crappy but kind of structural object-oriented program. You have state, you have methods that modify the state, and you have a specialization of it. So in functional programming, you have basically <laughs> names of objects. This is not required, but this is basically the always the way I do it. Um, you, you basically have a whole bunch of these simple little functions. You create some of your own simple functions, like is odd, and then you kind of mash them together using chain, uh, slice, map, filter, and a whole bunch of other ones. And hopefully you don't have internal state because that makes things exciting. So it sort of looks like this. You have a, a, little, a little seed of data. This little plant is a little seed of data. And then a little simple function, the, the little fish, and then bigger and bigger fish, and more and more toothy as you get to the left side. And that, that's more or less what uh, functional programming things look like. You have a little bit of data, and then you transform it using these different fishes, which is great because in a real program you read from a database or a file or whatever, but for testing you can just throw in data. And in practice you can move these fishes all around and you can test them each individually. So this is how you do a very important uh, write out. This is how you uh, uppercase every single line or file in your, and sort of like a functional programming style. So you still have the same bits. It still kind of requires that you're doing a, a files. And you basically, 
one difference between pr procedural programming and functional programming is you read it backwards, which makes the code look a lot sexier, but it also requires some brain, some severe and some, some brain machinations to be able to do this. So in this case, I'm writing out this output file from the input file, I'm doing open in.txt. And then I'm processing each line, and then I'm, for each line is being translated to upper, and that's returned as a iterator to right lines. So you're basically re reading it from right to left, which is kind of awkward. Functional programming looks a little different from normal stuff, so you may want to trade off how much functional programming you want to do because you want, to, you want it to be readable. But this is just two lines and it looks okay, so, you know, that's not too bad. Map. Uh, we've already taken a little bit of look at filter. Filter takes an iterator and then a, a little function like is odd, and it gives you those exact elements that match the function. So you always get you never you never transform the elements. You just get a subset. Map is exactly the opposite. Map you have a function, a little study function like upcase, and then you say run this function across all the iterator things on the right side. So map upcase means run uppercase on every single line within the input. And then it returns the, tran uh, the, the same length as on the right side, but every single line will be uppercased. So filter, you do uh, filtering, where you don't do any modification whatsoever. Map, you always do transformations, and you always get the same amount of data. But basically, filter and map you use together to transform and to modify your data. If you have a million elements, that's no problem. If you have a list, Maybe that'll be a little sketchy, but with these are iterators and it doesn't really matter too much. So map, you transform items using a function. Map and filter, you provide an item, you, you provide items matching the function. So questions on map and filter and stuff. Yeah, uh, there's a discomprehension syntax for map and filter. So if you use that, do you lose the Curator aspect of it, or because it's called list convention, so basically it's a list. Or is there is there a way to return iterators? Okay, so the question is uh, basically highlighting the. I'm using the more classical functional programming kind of names because they're more visual and you can search for it. Um, in Python, it directly supports um, what they call list comprehensions with the square brackets, which creates lists, and generator expressions with curly with uh, just single parentheses. Um, those are actually more preferred than map and filter. Um, however, in this case, I'm giving a more verbose version of the exact same thing. In practice, you probably wouldn't use a combination of both. Um, in, in fact, in practice, you probably want to use square brackets because they're de then you're dealing with lists and it's easier to, to understand what your code is going through. This, so this is more of a verbose version of what you would do in practice. Uh, another question? Great. So map and filter are the most important, so we'll, we'll go with that. So we have some more examples. So in this case, we have a very important old-fashioned recipe and um, file input. Who's used file input? Uh, a couple people. Okay, file input, for some reason people don't use this because even though it's awesome, but I mean, a lot of times people process every single line of like one or 10 or 100 files. File input, basically, if you just do file input.input, .input, it scans your sysargv and gets every single file, it opens every single file and gives you one line from each file in turn. So you get all, all your lines from the first file, then all your lines from the second file, all your lines from the third file. You don't have to mess with anything. So in this case, if you do, um, if you run this program on a hundred different files, it's going to read every single file and squash it together and print it out. So uh, you get every single line as a generator, as an iterator in file input.input. .input. So this is every single line. And then uh, you just tell Python to print it out and join it, put every single line with new lines or with uh, nothing to print it out. So you get your very important whiskey thing. This kind of shows you how powerful just these little simple uh, functions can be. 
this is really useful. So everybody go home and, and check out file input. Here's another one using iter tools. So in this case, what's, what's happening is I've got my recipe and I want to strip out all the comments. Um, and I also want to find out, hey, is there, is there a key and a value in the, in the recipe? So if, if you're reading this uh, bottom to top, at the very, out, very end, you're, you're printing out a whole bunch of lines. Before that, you're grabbing the lines from above it, and then you're filtering out all the, you want all the lines that have a key and a value in it. And then before that, you want to strip out the things that have a comment. So this is how you strip out comments. So you can see I filter and I filter false. They're basically identical, except they, they flip the, 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 the condition. So for me, it was easy to figure out if a line was a comment or not, because it has a hash in the very first, very first uh, character. And I didn't want to have has not, not, does not have a comment. That's just kind of silly. So I have has comment, and then I strip it out using my filter false. And then from the lines which are not comments, I then filter out and retain everything that has a key value. And therefore, I get the ingredients in my very important uh, recipe. So this shows how you can, have, you can have a stream. In this case, the stream is every single line from every single file using file input, dot input. You have a stream of lines of everything. And then you grab the comments and strip them out. Then you grab all the key values and, and keep them. And then you print them out. So you're able to, in functional programming, you have a bunch of little functions. You kind of patch them together. This is a similar kind of deal, um, except now we're dealing with regular expressions. So you read every single line of every single file as an iterator. And then you parse out the, the match. Um, this I filter none is a trick, which strips out all the things which are not matches. And then for the things which are matches, it translates them to strings and prints them out. This is an example of the generator, uh, what do you call this, the generator expression in Python with the parentheses? This is a generator expression. You have a, you have a parentheses here and parentheses at the end. And what it does is this, is this basically creates an iterator. If you use square brackets, then you get a list. But this is, this is the shorthand way of doing it in Python. And here we're doing the same deal, except we're doing a dictionary. I think you guys get the point of this, so we'll, we'll uh, just skip that. Right, Inner Tools has a bunch of cool stuff in it. Uh, chain is like plus. You give it as many iterators as you want to, and it consumes all the values of the first one, consumes all the values of the second one, and so forth. Uh, compress, you have count, you have cycle, which is useful for testing. You do cycle bracket one, two, three, and it'll do one, two, three, one, two, one, three, one, two, three all the time. Uh, drop while, sort of like filter. Uh, group by, group by is super useful. It's like SQL group by. I found that I could never actually get the order of the arguments correct, but group by is very useful. I filter and I filter false, you guys have already seen. I map is basically does what it says. It takes a transform function and an iterator and it runs it through. Um, slice. Zip is actually useful. Who uses just normal zip or iZip? Okay, a good number of people, okay. Uh, zip is nice. You give it a couple different lists, and it takes the first element from the first list, the first element from the second list, the first element from the third list, and so forth. So if you're doing, like, if you're printing out, uh, like, columns and rows, zip is really nice. The zip is stupid, so if your lists are the wrong size, some of that they need padding or something like that, you're not going to get the right, it'll start, it'll stop outputting your stuff. So you want to use iZip longest for that case. And some other ones. Intertools has a bunch of cool stuff. And this stuff is generally is kind of boring, but since it's in the standard Python library, everybody understands it and they're efficient. So chain we've, already, we've discussed is basically for iterators. And slice is similar to slicing for a list. One thing you'll see I do this all the time. You do the normal um, shell. 
So you do a list, one, two, three, bracket two, you get 1.2, 1, 2. Do an iterator, bracket two, it, goes, it gives you a trace back. Saying the list iterator doesn't have a get item. And okay, that makes sense. All the time I do this because I forget. So you do underscore. Underscore in Python means the last, if you're doing the interactive shell, it means the last value. So if you get these errors all the time, like I do, then just do list of the underscore, and it'll give you a graphical, uh, it'll give you a textual representation of your iterator. So this is actually used a lot. Do list um, underscore, you're, you're done. Um, a side effect of iterators is once you consume them, they're gone. Which means that if you print them out, they're now consumed and they're gone. Which means that if you're in the middle of your program and you continue, anything downstream is not going to have any data because the data is already gone. This actually causes a bunch of bugs. Um, so you basically want to create everything as an iterator. Print it out when you can, but don't print it out all the time because then you, you're going to consume the data. Uh, question? So the question is, can you use something like T, which will copy the iterator? So therefore, you take one of the iterators, convert it to a list and print it out, but you still have a copy of the iterator to, to use for your program. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think it's not sure. That's, that sounds like it. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. I think I'm going to add that to the next time I get this topic. Uh, because I've actually done this a lot. You know, you print out your thing, it looks perfectly fine, but your program doesn't work. Because when you printed it out, it got consumed, and therefore it's gone. So, okay. so slice is similar to uh, the list. Here's an example from a third-party library called Tools. There's actually a bunch of really cool um, stuff that's out there for functional programming with and without Python. There's a bunch of cool libraries, some of which actually modify the syntax of Python. So they look bizarre, um, but they also look really cool. Um, tools seems to be pretty popular. This is an example. I'll just kind of hand wave it through you uh, with you. So at the very end, you have a very important sentence. The cat jump, jumped over the other cat. And you do a word count of the sentence. So this happened twice, the cat happened twice, something like that. And what it does is, and like all the functional programming stuff, you have a bunch of small functions, and you combine them together. But these are different functions. They're in a third-party library. You've got to use pip install for this. So you do word count equals compose. I don't know what that means. Frequencies, map stem, str split. OK, so it does string split on the sentence to get every single individual word. And then it runs stem on them. So each, so it strips out the, uh, the, the, the exclamation point. And it also makes them lowercase. And then it runs this frequencies program, which I guess does frequencies of words or something. I don't know. But it's nice, because now you have a word count program, which, which is made out of one line, which uses a standard thing from this third party library and a one line function, which simplifies a word. And now, you, now your program's done. And now you can go home and, and drink old fashions because your program is done and you don't have to do anything, right? Um, you will see that this is, I think the technical term is uh, unreadable. If you don't know what you're doing, this is going to be super confusing. So you have to use some of, programs are read more, much more often than they're written. So you're going to have to use this judiciously in your programs to figure out, you know, how much do you want to do cool, really concise programs? really cool, very efficient programs, and how much do you want it to be readable? So this is an example from the third-party language, a third-party library called Tools. There's a ton of things, including, I was really kind of surprised, there's two free functional programming books, one from Pact Publishing and one from O'Reilly. And they actually look pretty good. Um, I like professional books because they're well-written and they're all co also consistent. Whereas if you search for stuff on Stack Overflow, you get one thing that might have been accurate at one time for this one little little needle case. Whereas a book, you actually get a lot of a lot of things. You can check that out here, leisure. Right. So we have Snowman, which means we're now getting to Django query sets. Yay. So how many people have been working for Django more than a year? Okay, a lot of people. Okay, that's cool. 
uh, a very short query set review. If you have a meeting um, model, a model is basically a class which lives in the database. If a meeting model uses magic objects thing, you do get ID equals one, it does a database query. Um, if you grab this object and then dump out the vars for it, the dictionary that, of the, that, that makes up the object, you get the individual fields like meet date, and then you get these magic things that you probably shouldn't touch. Magic, the underscore means magic, so we'll just leave it at that. <clears throat> this is how you do a query. You do your uh, model object, and then filter, name, which is a field, double underscore, um, I contains, so this is case insensitive search. And then you can print out the, the results. <clears throat> I got down this, this path because query sets and iterators are both shifty. I mentioned if you have per iterators in your program and you print them out, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, so you print out your iterator and then it vanishes. You're like, what the hell is going on? Query sets are the exact same way. So if you do meeting.objects filter name equals Java, of course there's no, there's no meetings like that. So you get X, which is an empty list. But it's not an empty list. If you do type of X, it says da 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 query set which actually doesn't make any sense at all. <clears throat> so the deal is the query sets look really strange in Python. It looks like a list, it is not a list. So this comes to sort of an existential question in uh, how do you tell if a list is empty or not? How do you tell if an iterator is empty or not? How do you tell if a query set is iterator or not, is empty or not? Is it more like a list? Is it more like a uh, Iterator. In Django, query sets have a lot of nice features. Um, it'll automatically, um, well, it'll let you deal with SQL so you don't have to, which is great. It'll automatically batch things and tell the database, hey, give me the first 100 results, and then and so it's really fast up to that, that kind of thing. And you can even do slicing. You can do bracket zero, and you can actually get chunks of the, the database results, which is really nice. Whereas you can't do that in Python with normal slices. But it is, it is a little strange. Right, so how do you tell if a list is empty or not? Come on, you all know this. Length, Boolean, yes. Uh, what about the third one? No? Mm, no. Um, actually, that was a tricky one, that was if. So an empty list. If you do Boolean of the empty list, you get false. If you do Boolean of a very important uh, list with items in it, you get true. What about an empty iterator? How do you tell if it's empty or not? If you do x equals iter one, two, so therefore the iterator has some objects in it, you do Boolean of x, you get true. Oh, that's great. The iterator has some items in it. Oh, that's great. But if I do iterator of an empty list, I do boolean of x, and it's true also. This is super confusing. But it's sort of like, an iterator is basically like, if, imagine if you opened a file handle. You just have a handle. You haven't consumed any data yet. So it doesn't know anything about the contents. There's a difference between the handle of something and then the actual contents. How do you tell if a query set is empty or not? Answers? Counts. Exists. Counts. Count. Those are good ones. Force into a list, right? Coerce into a list. That'll work. I'm saying count. Force into a list. Right? Count does coerce into a list. Yeah. So, so query set is basically like an iterator. Um, if you do filter, you get this you get this object which looks like a list even though it isn't. You can, uh, you can use a good old fashioned functional programming filter and give it a function. You can do a filter with an iterator um, where the right hand side is just the ID 2, 1, 2 thing. So this is, these are basically like testing versions of model query sets. A query set is an iterator. So in the first case, 
in, in the, the second case, you're basically getting a query set um, based off of your, your thing. So basically, you, and the query set is an iterator, and it, it, it obeys the iterator protocol. You can mix, mix and match query sets and iterators, like you can do bracket zero. You can do I slice. This is actually nice for uh, different, different reasons. You can do more I slices, and you can convert it back and forth. So you can actually use the traditional functional programming stuff, and you can use the normal query sub stuff together. But not always. So the answer to how can you tell if a query set is empty or not is actually really tricky. The answer is use x.exists, um, and I can prove it. Basically, proof is you can trust me, but here's some other stuff. Whoever uses query set to query? Wise ass. You, you use it? I have a crazy join. Yeah, crazy join. Okay. This is actually super awesome. What it does, what, what query set query does, it gives you the original SQL. Which means if you hate SQL, you can do all your stuff in Django query sets, and then you can do dot query, and you current you uh, so in here you do, you have a, have a filter on a project. So you do strp.query and it dumps out the SQL for me. This is awesome. Because then you can just like cut and paste this, use it in another another case. If Django is freaking out, you can tell what it's talking about. This, you can uh, save and restore this to other things. Uh, this is really nice. But this doesn't work in all cases, because that would be too easy. So if you do, I'm trying to prove that p.exists is the most efficient way to tell whether a query set is empty or not. So if you do p.exists, it says true, there is something in this, in this query set. If you, if you dump out the SQL with dot .query, it says the Boolean doesn't have an attribute called query. So there's another way to get SQL out of Django. George, you know this one? Uh, use um, connection queries. Uh, so this is another way to do it. Um, if, you, if you use count, you're getting a number and there is no SQL there. If you do exists, you get a Boolean, there is no SQL there. So what you do is you use this uh, DB connection queries thing, and you also get, you get a history of every single SQL query that your Django program does, which means that you do uh, something that exists, which is a Boolean you can't get a SQL from, and then you use this history thing to figure out exactly what it was doing. And you can use this to figure out if Django is being efficient or not. And this is the exact qu query that it uses for exists. So to select one as uh, from the table where something equals something limit one. So the database returns nothing if the entire table is empty. And it returns one element, which is then ignored if there's any data in the database table at all. Therefore, the database is doing all the work. Therefore, exists is the best way to figure out if something is, is uh, empty or not. So uh, that covers the, uh, the entirety of the discussion. Basically, iterators and generators are a stream. You use them constantly with functional programming, which is very sexy sounding. And you can use lots of cool functions, and it's very efficient, but kind of hard, can be hard to read. And a query set is basically a stream. So are there any more questions? Marcel? Sure. Uh, so when you first started using uh, functional programs and getting familiar with it, um, and getting comfortable with it, like what were some areas where you found a ready application for them? Like what were some areas where in either building new code or looking over your old code, you were like, oh, I want to use functional programming here instead of whatever I might have been doing in the past? Do you have a couple examples? So the question is, um, in my experience, when do I start using more functional programming versus more traditional stuff? <clears throat> Especially when you were first getting started. Uh, I used to write a lot of object-oriented programs, but I found them to be very brittle in terms of you now want to test the beer function on your, your drinky object. You know, how do you actually get the object to the right state? Then you can call the beer method, therefore you can actually test the beer method. It's like everything was kind of mashed together. So I used to start 
hoisting the, the functions out to be independent units, and then the, the, the class would just be this like bag of these different methods. Uh, in terms of functional programming, I basically do this for um, pretty much always. I write a teeny little function and I use a mapper filter across the input and I see what the result looks like. And then uh, pretty much it. I don't actually use the iter tool stuff very much at all, like even just slicing, because I want to process everything pretty much. If I want to see what I want to look at, I use list, which is darky, but really, you know, lets me see what I'm doing. Um, I'm actually kind of curious that the, uh, if you guys actually know about functional programming, come to talk to me later so that I can learn from you guys. Because there's lots of cool stuff, but I can never really tell, like, if you use the cool stuff and it's unreadable, then you're not getting anything. So for me, I use, I use map and filter, and um, I filter and I filter false and I glob. I use them constantly for pretty much all my code. Uh, but the more esoteric things, one, well, not so much. And again, you have to trade off between readability and, and uh, coolness. Uh, more questions? Uh, going back to iterators. So iterators. Yeah, is it, am I correct in understanding that you can't tell if an iterator is empty? That's correct. You cannot tell if an iterator is empty without consuming it. So for an iterator, actually that's true, I didn't cover this, I guess. So if you have an iterator like on your file handle, you basically have to consume it doing uh, f.next. Mm -hmm. If you get an exception, that means you're, you're, there's no data there, therefore it is empty. But in either case, you're going to consume all the data. So it depends on what you want. Gotcha. Uh, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay. More questions? Okay, cool. I would like to uh, thank the, the people here at uh, Tyloner, uh, especially Ellie, who, who magically made the, the food and the beer appear, so thank you. Uh, Marcel for uh, inviting me to have this talk. Mr. Brian for coming up and donating um, the, the cool library for, for testing Django stuff. And my wonderful partner, Gus, for uh, doing videoing the proceedings. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much.